Okay, um, welcome. I hope every, everyone is here that can get here. Um, why don't we get started in the name of the, in the prayer, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from every evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm hoping um, things are going well. We're still kind of going through the same motions every day. Doesn't seem to be much of a change, but I'm looking forward to tonight. Um, we're looking tonight at the last uh, overview of the first part of the Nicene Creed. Uh, we've been looking at, as we, uh, as we remember, the aspects of the Nicene Creed that deal with God the Father. We know that we worship a Trinitarian God, a God in three persons. And we started off by looking at the perfections of what we know about God. We also started off by talking about theology which is the study of God, the science of God, if you will. And the fact that in the Catholic Church, we have a, a tremendous uh, foundation of theology based on philosophy that, that gives us insights into what we believe God has revealed to us uh, through sacred scripture and sacred tradition through the apostles. Um, so we believe that the entire teaching that we have uh, constitutes the Old Testament, which is the story of the Jewish people selected by God through Abraham and his followers up to the arrival of the anointed one, the, the king of the Jews, the king of Israel, the, the new kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which occurred in the New Testament. And right now we're looking at the, the foundational understanding from theology of God the Father. So we looked at his perfections, his, his attributes, and we said basically we could conclude um, anything about God basically by looking at what he would not be. So we would say, I would not worship a God who lied. Therefore, we could say the opposite is we worship a God of truth and what he's revealed to us is true and so on. And then we looked at his element within the Trinity, the three persons. So the person is a, uh, is an entity with an intellect and a will. Um, most of the persons uh, in the, of the, the majority of the persons of the Trinity, the two uh, main ones are only spiritual. There's no physical nature to God the Father or the Holy Spirit. But as we'll start next week, we will look at the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. And we will see how he is different in that he is like us in all things uh, but sin. So we started off with this creed. Um, where we are in looking at the Father is that we say every time we repeat the creed, particularly at every Mass, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker or creator of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible. Last week, we looked at the Almighty Father who created heaven and things invisible. So last week, we spent the time on the creation of angels um, and the creation of the um, evil, I mean, uh, the allowing of some angels to choose to disregard or to leave heaven or to be cast out of heaven for not willing to serve, and that created the demonic side. We also looked at last week, 
the creation of the earth it, itself. And we saw the seven days of creation from scripture. And we said last week that the first 11 books of the Old Testament, which we believe were given to Moses on Mount Sinai after the people of Israel came out of Egypt after 430 years, that these first 11 chapters are theological explanations for creation. How did we get here? What's our background? Who are we? How were we created? And we believe that God revealed in a relatively simple or non-complex manner um, an explanation for the creation and existence of all things uh, on earth and, and in heaven. Uh, so this is where we are uh, after looking at that, seeing the creation of the earth in seven days. And we saw that in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, meaning beginning. And we saw that the first chapter deals with this creation story. And we saw last week that there were six full days of creation, each sort of in a poetic balance where the, the, the darkness was divided from the light on the first day, and then the third day, the sun was created. So we, we saw that, the first six days of creation. The sixth and final day of creation was the creation of man. And this is what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at basically the theological explanation of who is man, what is man, how were we made, um, and then we're going to look at what we did to cause a, a rift between us, the creature, and God, the creator, that have been with mankind from the very first couple, whom scripture tells us is Adam and Eve. Adam basically means man, a being. And so Adam and Eve were the first couple, first persons made. And we'll look at that in its uh, awesomeness in a few moments. But this is where we are, what we're about, and what we're looking toward. And then after we get through this last chapter, if you will, on the role of God the Father in his theological role of creation, we will then go and look at the Son, the second person of create, the second person of the Trinity, and how he impacted all of this and how he impacts uh, our life and our salvation. So at this point, we want to go forward and look at this magnificent, uh, marvelous, physical creation. And there's two creation stories um, in, the, in the Bible. Um, the first one is chapter 1, and it goes through chapter 2, verse 4. And then the second one is in chapter 2 and following up to um, chapter 3. And we see here this marvelous explanation of how man and later woman came to be an image in the mind of God the Father that he brought forth out of nothing by speaking, by creating, and he created uh, these first two beings, human beings. And it's interesting. I, uh, I think it'd be worthwhile to read a little bit to get an idea of what this story looks like. And he said, um, he said in, in chapter two, verse four and following, he said, in, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant or field was yet on the earth, no herb in the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth where there were no man to till the ground, but the mist went up from the earth and, and watered the whole face of the ground. And then the Lord formed man, Adam, of dust. And that's when we say at funerals, uh, from dust to dust. We come from dust. When we die, we decompose into dust. That's the physical part. And he said, this man, this man he formed of dust from the ground, he breathed. This is spirit. This is the, the pneuma. This is the breathing of God's word into the God's person, his, his, his creative power into this 
first man. And he said he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. And the Lord God, God planted a garden in Eden east and put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that was pleasant for the sight and good for, for food and the trees of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And there was a river that flowed out from there and there was all kinds of precious stones and that sort of thing. And it said, then the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. This is where the Catholic church sees the significant importance of taking care of the earth, the environment. We're not for wasting things. We're not for uh, just abusing things or overusing things. We have a responsibility as human being to take care of the environment that God created for us to live in. So we put him in the garden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded to man saying, you may eat freely of every tree in the garden, except, this is now when you think about it, one commandment, the first and only commandment that God gave to the first man. He said, he said, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Basically, this is withholding morality or the de definition of morals to God. God created us. He knows what's good for us. He knows how we should uh, be happy. And so he restricted the decision of what's good and evil to himself. And he said, that's forbidden from you. That's the only thing. You cannot eat of that tree because if you eat of that tree, then you'll begin to make decisions for good and, more, and evil and you'll make wrong decisions and you'll cause a problem. So this was for our own good. I remember years and years ago when we had little children, we went to some parenting class. And um, it's funny, parenting is one of the most obvious on the job training uh, things that you can learn. There's very little that people can write that you can fully understand. You just have to experience it. But this child psychologist was telling us uh, uh, about the, the importance of being um, defining the rules and making sure your children understand that you're the authority figure and that they must obey you. And, and, she, and she gave two examples of how the child perceive her, her loving, caring uh, for the child by restricting them. And how the child saw this as, as um, that restricting them for their own good, how the child saw this was denying them the freedom that they thought they deserved. And she said, first of all, was her son. Her son was like five years old and he loved to go in the car with her. And he had a tendency that the minute she pulled into a parking lot, even before she could turn the engine off, he would open the door and jump out. And she was terrified that one day he was gonna jump out in traffic. He wasn't paying any attention. He didn't know anything about other cars. So he just wanted to get out of the car right away. So he'd open the door, jump out, and she was afraid he was gonna get run over by somebody pulling into the parking spot next to her. So she said, I restricted him. I got a little harness and I, and I connected the harness uh, to the car. And that prevented him from jumping out of the car and maybe get run over. Now she said, I did that because I loved him. I restricted him out of love. He thought it was terrible. He wanted to jump out and run around. Her other example was her teenage daughter. I know I think she was 15, whatever. And she said her teenage daughter wanted to date, single date, just she and a guy at age 15. And the mother said lovingly, I know what's out there. I know what it's like. I've been through this. It's very dangerous. And you're not old enough to make the right decisions at 15. So you may not date singly 15. You can go out the group of people. You can have a guy that you go be with in that group, fine, but you cannot date singly. She thought that this was the worst mother on the face of the earth. All my friends get to do it. Why not? Uh, you don't understand. You don't love me. And the child psychologist said just the opposite. I loved her and therefore I restricted her till she was old enough to be able to take care of herself. Now, why am I telling you? That's what the commandments are. That's what, that's what God is saying here. He's saying, I love you, Adam, 
I want to give you freedom to do anything you want, but you're not mature enough, you haven't experienced enough to be able to make these kinds of decisions. And so I'm restricting you. Do not eat from the tree of good and evil. And so then he goes on and he said, um, he goes on and said, you should not eat from the tree of knowledge and of good and evil, and you, nor shall you eat. For that day that you eat it, you shall die. And then the Lord said, it's not good for man to be alone, so I will make a helper for him. Now, this is not chauvinism. He's not making a competitor for him. She's making, he's making someone to be compatible with him. Marriage is compatibility. Each person giving themselves completely to the other in, in love. Surrendering 100% of myself to Beverly, she surrendered 100% of herself to me, not 50-50. We're not, so this is the idea that he, he created this helper for him. So out of the ground, he formed every beast in the field and so on. Then Adam named them all. And then the Lord caused a deep sleep upon Adam and he took out one of his ribs. This is just symbolic explanation and closed up the flesh. And when he had taken out of the rib, he made it into a woman and brought the woman to man. And at last, Adam saw her and he said, at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother, cleaves to the wife, and the two become one flesh. That's the ultimate definition of marriage. That is the reason the Catholic Church sees marriage as indissoluble. That's why the church goes into so much preparation for preparing a couple for marriage because of this commandment. Bob, and then we may, yes, yes, question. Um, well, I wanted to add um, something on, because you brought up a good point about or when you described. Um, Who's speaking? I can't, I don't have This is Kiera. Kiera, okay. When you mentioned um, God telling Adam uh, not to eat from the tree of um, the knowledge of good and evil, yeah, and I never really thought about that. I, I'm a Protestant background, and I never sure. really thought about um, that. I've never really thought too much about that. And when God said that, I only knew that that is what they were not supposed to do, but they sure, did it. Sure, sure. So, what when I read in um, our chapters for this week, I learned about the sin of omission and the sin of commission, which I've heard of it before, but sure. the book went a lot more in depth about it. And I also discovered with just my own um, learning of the faith is that it's just as much of a sin to know that something's a sin or to, to deprive yourself of finding out more about something that you know would be wrong. Sure, sure. Um, so I, I, I kind of feel like, I mean, obviously I could be wrong, but it just brings more light to God um, out of love, not having people learn about the knowledge or not having them eat from that tree and holding yeah. that for himself. Because when we do know that something's wrong, we are putting ourselves at that, you know, risk or we deprive ourselves of, I don't know how to explain it, but no, it no, just, you're, very, you're yeah. doing a very good job. And I do exactly understand. We are going to discuss a little bit of, uh, if I ever, you know, I teach Bible study, so I get carried away. Uh, we will get into the idea of sin tonight, just a, a little bit. But in the course of the, the, the whole year, we're going to spend a lot of time on sin. We'll look at all aspects of it. We'll look at contrition, being sorry for sin. We'll look at uh, how we're forgiven our sins and all that sort of thing. We'll get an overview of it tonight. But it's very, very true. We don't think about it very much. Uh, and that's why theology is so important, because the theologians have looked at these scriptures and gotten into an understanding in the language, in the culture, in the time of what was actually meant. What is What was God revealing to man in these scriptures? And it certainly is true. You can sin by omission and you can sin by commission. Commission means I commit a sin. I come up and punch somebody in the face for no reason. That would be wrong. I rob a bank. That would that would be wrong. But I also can commit a sin of omission, where I see a brother um, very starving, and he he's begging for food, and I have an excess. I'm I'm on a picnic, and I have all this extra food, and I walk right by him. I'm not doing something that I should do. That's a sin of uh, omission. I fail to do something I should do. So sins can go in a variety of ways. 
and we'll look at those. But that's an excellent point. And I'm very grateful that you would ask it because I, I would much rather have questions than me just go through this uh, lecture. But anyway, thank, thank you so you. much. I hope that, that did help. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, um, we then see the creation of Eve. And then we see the result of this in the fall. And I'll, we'll look at that in just a second. But what I want to dwell on right here from, from the author of our book's point of view is this magnificent creation when you think about it. And if you're like me, I mean, you know, I just, I just grew up, um, I was a, a child and I was a teen, you know, a little, a little older, then I went to school, then I became a teenager and then I became a man. And all during this life, I've just had this body, it's who it, who it is. And I've, I never really thought much about what it consisted of. I never really delved into the complexity of it. Now, the first time I think I really appreciated this more than ever before, as I mentioned, was the birth of a child. Now, I, didn't, I wasn't there at the birth of our first child, our son. I was in, in Vietnam and he was born uh, while I was overseas and I didn't see him until he was six months old. But when our daughter was born, I was there and I saw her as an infant the first day of her life. And, that, that inc and the third child the same way. The incredible marvel of a child a newborn infant with all of its fingers and toes and nose and ears and all the beauty of that little teeny body and all of the organs and all the things inside is what is so incredible. And then if you go into from the sort of the macrocosm to the microcosm and you go into the depths of it and go all the way down into the cell, uh, our oldest son is a geneticist, but he's really well, he's a molecular biologist, but his work is in genetics. So he's dealing with the components of the cell, the subset within a cell itself, the DNA. He's dealing with the enzymes and the proteins and the things that make the cell change. And he does research on the fruit fly because he can cause a, a deformity, if you will, in a cell in a fruit fly. And then he can watch that deformity progress over generations because fruit flies only live a couple of weeks. So he can do a long-term genetic study using fruit flies within the cell of the fly itself. So this is just the, the ability of science to go all the way into our molecular structure and see all of the magnificence of everything that goes into each cell that's got a unique role to play within a unique organism, within a system, is just amazing. And that's just a little bit of these slides here. The idea that we have a muscular structure. Um, we have a v vascular structure. The, the, the whole thing is amazing the way that, that it, it all works out. We have a friend uh, who just went through surgery to do repair on her heart valve. Now, when I was young, we didn't repair heart valves. You didn't even do open heart surgery. Today, they can make a little incision in your, in your groin and go up through the veins and get to your heart and, and, ref, and fix things uh, in the heart itself while it's still functioning. This is what science has been able to do to bring us to this opportunity to keep us alive longer and healthier and make these wonderful things. So this is all what God created. Now, from a theological point of view, we have a physical body and a spiritual body. The other component to man is that he has a soul, or the Bible calls it your heart, the center of you, the thing that makes you unique. There's a 18 or 19 people in the class. Basically, we're all homo sapiens. We're all from the same species, if you will. We got men and women, um, but, but we basically are you know, built with these same uh, systems that are in us and they're, they're really marvelous. But we all have a unique soul, the sense of our entity, our being, our essence. Um, so we say we are unity of body and soul. And we say that God created us in his image and likeness. That's all throughout the Bible. Does that mean God looks like me? No. Does it mean he looks like Beverly or you? No. It means that we're created in his Im image in our spiritual side. Our spirit is spiritual like God is spiritual. 
the image of God is in our spirit. Now we all look similar and children sometimes look like their parents and so on, but, but that's not the image. The image is on our spiritual side. Now, as I mentioned, all beings possess an intellect and a will. So we reason with our intellect. We can, we can make decisions. We can think of abstracts. And our will, we love. We choose to love things in our emotion and in our, in our choosing to accept that great uh, willingness to love as God loves us. So a soul is basically an entity in all persons that's immortal. We believe that God creates the soul at conception, the joining of the two cells, and the soul will exist in eternity. And eternity shouldn't be conceived of as 24 hour days going on and on and on. It's not a repetition and boring 24 hour days going on and on and on. And sometimes you think of it that way and you think, well, won't I get bored? I mean, yeah, so I'll be on a cloud and I have a harp and I know some music. How many times can I play the song? That's not the image. The image is that you will exist in, a, in an, either a, a, a different concept of a time or timelessness. I like to think of it as no change in time. It, it, you're just there. Um, I remember several times in my life where I have what I would call a mountaintop experience. It may have been, it may have been going on a retreat and I had this wonderful spiritual moment. It may have been at our wedding when, when I truly realized that I was exchanging vows with the, the, my favorite person in the world and we were gonna spend our lives together. That moment, the joy of that moment or the birth of a child or graduation. Those were mountaintop moments where, where you felt so wonderful. And I remember a truly mountaintop moment is when we were in the Holy Land and we went up on Mount Tabor and Mount Tabor is where the transfiguration occurred. And there's this big church up there. It's got three parts to it to, to simulate the, 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 the three images that were there. And um, we had lunch in a monastery run by some wonderful Italian nuns. And it was just, the, the view was just absolutely breathtaking. It was one of the most beautiful peaceful places. And I remember my wife, Beverly, and, and a dear friend of ours that was on the pilgrimage with us saying, I wish I could stay here forever. I wish this moment would never end. And that's what paradise would be like. It would be truly experiencing the greatest spiritual, joyful moment that you can imagine, and it never ends. You're just there. You're just dwelling in it. So your soul is immortal. And that's a very important thing theologically to accept because our actions impact where that soul will in fact be in the next life. And that's what the whole course is about. That's why you want to become a Christian. That's why you want to become baptized. That's why you want to receive the sacraments. That's why you want to study the theology so that you can do everything in your power on our pilgrimage's life. Remember, pilgrimage is, is destined to a holy place. So life is destined towards paradise. It's destined toward the beatific vision with God in the Trinity. That's our goal. And we're going there and we have an opportunity to get there or we have the opportunity to be detoured or to go off the path or to go in a different direction and end up somewhere totally, totally different, unacceptable and actually terrifying. So we believe that the soul is immortal. We also believe that the soul animates or enlivens or makes alive the body. So we have this marvelous physical body that has all of its components when a child is born. It's all been developing through those nine months. It's been there since the conception and the soul has been in there since the conception and the soul makes that flesh alive. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced it. I certainly, unfortunately, had the, the misfortune of having it happen, but to have an animal that you like very much die. In one moment, this, this dog is, is there. It, it may be sick, but it's there, and you can see it's there through its eyes. There is something about an animal's eyes when they're alive that, it, that is gone the minute, the minute they die. The light goes off. You can just tell that there's nothing enlivening the dog. 
And that's what the soul does. It enlivens the body. It makes us alive. And you are alive until the moment the soul separates from the body, which occurs at some point in the death process. Now, the soul then will eventually, promised by Christ at his second coming, whenever that is, and he said, only the Father knows when that will be. So it, it may or may not ever happen in your lifetime that the second coming of Christ would occur. But I will promise you one thing in your lifetime, your life will end. And whether that's the moment of the second coming or whether that's your death, that's going to be this, that's going to be the moment for you where the soul separates from the body. So we know that that will occur to each of us at some time. And then we know that at the resurrection of Christ, that spiritual soul will be reunited with a resurrected body. Theologians surmise that that body would be very similar to what Christ's body looked like from the time of his resurrection on Easter Sunday morning until he ascended into heaven. People could see it. They could touch it, he was, he, but he could go through walls, he could bilocate, he, it was different. It radiated on the Mount of Transfiguration. He had a, had a resurrected body in that sense that you could see it, it glowed with light from within. It's just marvelous. We'll all get one of those because man is created with a body and a soul. And after at death, they're separated until the second coming when they'll be reunited. I always laugh and joke and say that I put in a requisition since I'm only five foot six inches tall in my physical present state. I've requested a body, a uh, resurrected body of over six feet tall, so I won't have to be short. So whatever you dream of, then you can put in your requisition and hopefully that will be honored, but I doubt it. But it's just something that helps you idea that you're gonna have a resurrected body. Now this, this soul, helps us understand truth. Truth we believe, the veritas, we believe this is what God wants to reveal to us. And it is intrinsically true and it isn't gonna change. And man doesn't devise it. And this also gives us through the soul the ability to make judgments. You choose between good and evil. You choose between right and wrong. You choose between light and darkness. And we also believe that through this intellect and will, we can seek and we can find God. That's why it's so important. Here's an example of, of, a, of a Hebrew writing. This is an example of a Jew. They, they read their books from back to front, right to left. Don't ask me why, but that's just the way they do it. We do it the other way around. But the point is, man has been spiritual from the beginning. Man has sought to relate to God. This is where we'll get into a great deal of em emphasis on prayer, which is simply talking to God. Prayer is just talking to God, just like I'm talking to you. Now, the foundation of our spiritual life comes from initially in the Old Testament, what the Jews called the law. Pentateuch, Greek for five, pent penta, five teachings, five books, and the Jews also called it the Torah. So you'll hear people talk about the, the law of Moses, the, the law of the Jews, the Torah, the Pentateuch. All of them refer to the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, which is the story of the first 11 chapters, the story of creation. And then it's the story of Abraham and his descendants down to uh, the time the people of Israel ended up in Egypt. Exodus is the story of Moses bringing the people out of Israel and going to the promised land. And it is followed by Leviticus, which gives a lot of stories, a lot of information about how to worship God, the Levitical priesthood. How do you prepare to worship God in the way God wants us to worship it? Numbers is a lot about genealogy, and Numbers has some of the historical parts of it as well. And Deuteronomy is kind of like the last will and testament of, of Moses or the, his last uh, address, the farewell address of Moses. It's like Washington's farewell address to the nation. Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell address to the people of Israel. All of that book, those five books constitute what we call the law and the Pentateuch or the Torah. All right, looking on further in this creation of man, he said, how did God make it, made us? That's very interesting that the theologians 
have determined that God gave us certain abilities that we lost due to original sin. And we and those the theologians call them preternatural gifts. We all know we have natural natural gifts. We have natural abilities. Most people can walk erect. Um, uh, most people can can move. M many people can swim. Most people can ride a bike. There's all kinds of things that we can do naturally by nature because we are by nature human persons with these abilities. Those are gifts of God that we call natural gifts. Then there are supernatural gifts. And those are the gifts that God gives to the spirit. And we're going to spend the whole semester looking at how the God through the Holy Spirit gives us supernatural gifts that enable us to grow closer to him and to each other and to live a, a life of love and a life of service to each other through the gifts of God. And they're, they're called supernatural. Now, the theologians said that we had preternatural gifts, which existed until the fall. And the fall, the sin, the original sin, the first sin, caused us to lose that. And these are called the, the four, the three aspects of the preternatural gifts were we had integrity of soul and body. The flesh and the soul were not in competition. We didn't have a fancy theological word concupiscence concupiscence, which is the, the temptation of the flesh, this desire for uh, sexual desires and that sort of thing, particularly outside of their proper context within marriage. This is an area of sinfulness that is part of it. Well, there was none of that. Uh, Adam and Eve were naked and they saw nothing wrong with that. And and some of the, the Jewish theologians, the rabbis, thought that that was because they were covered by the glory cloud. But once there was original sin, Adam and Eve recognized they were naked and they were embarrassed and they were hiding from God because of their nakedness, because there was something outside of the way it should be to them. And that's the integrity. We lost that ability. Now we have these temptations. The body was supposed to be immortal. Death is the result of sin. Death was, does not cause sin, and, and sin does not cause death. Death occurs because we sinned, and that caused us to lose our immortality. We were never intended to die or be sick. We were intended to live in paradise. That's what the theologians tell us when you look at the story of the Garden of Eden. But it was that original sin, that violation of the commandment I read you, don't eat from this tree. They did. And then there was the consequences. And the consequences, they started making right and wrong. And they started making moral decisions. And they started to think that they could be like God. And we also had a certain amount of knowledge that we called infused knowledge beyond what we would learn. Now, all of us learned basically the, the ways to live uh, through a process of growing up. If When you have a child, there's nothing more fun to watch than a child learning to walk. Well, first they crawl and then they stand up and hold on to things. And then they let go and fall. And then you pick them up. And then eventually they take a step and then they learn to walk. And then they learn to talk. They learn to talk by listening to you. You know, it's always a question in, in a marriage. What's his first word? Is it gonna be mama or dada? I'll bet you nine out of 10 it's mama because she spends more time with it. But the point is you learn from sounds and you watch your parents and you see them and you, you see how their lips are formed and you learn to talk. talk. So you learn knowledge. But there are certain things that the preternatural gifts gave about God and insights into God that were known to Adam and Eve. That's why they could walk with him in this image that they walked with him in the garden in the cool of the evening. That was the image of this intimacy between God and Adam and Eve. They lost that with the, with the original sin. So these are the things that we're, the foundation that we're setting so we can build on why we study these theological things. So there's Adam and Eve in the garden and all the animals were peaceful. Adam named them all. Everything was fine until the fall. Now, here's just a chart that, I, that you will have that gives you the natural gifts, the preternatural gifts, 
and the supernatural gifts. And we'll study those. We're going to look at sanctifying graces, the virtues and the gifts of the spirit. Um, and we know what our natural gifts are. But we just saw how we lost the preternatural gifts. All right. So the question comes up is what happened after Adam sinned? And I've got to clear up something really, really important right here. Male chauvinism, particularly over the billion, the years and years that we've been out here, um, so often have blamed Eve for the fall. And they just said, well, you know, Adam was fine. And it was Eve. Eve is the one that took the apple. But it's, first of all, it's not an apple. That's what's really funny. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Apple comes from art. Apple comes from this picture right here. This is where we get the idea that it's an apple. If you look at the scripture, it says fruit. Do not eat the fruit of this tree. So it could have been a banana. I don't know. It could have been a pomegranate or whatever. Who knows? But it wasn't defined as an apple. But anyway, that's what we think of it as. But Eve was not totally responsible on her own for this fall. Adam was the, the man of the house. Adam was the father of the husband of Eve and the father of their children. He had a responsibility. He had to govern the garden. He had been told by God not to eat of that fruit. He knew better. He was to protect her. Why did he not interfere with the serpent? Why did Adam not stop Eve from being tempted by the serpent? Why didn't he stomp on the serpent? He just sat there and watched her be tempted by the serpent. Now we know this is mythological language, but we know the first sin did happen. Theology tells us that we're all descendants of one couple. We all came from Adam and Eve. By the way, in genetics, they have gone back and, 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 and also in other sciences and found that there's a genetic gene in all persons from one source, and they've named that source Eve. So even the sciences have used the Bible as a basis for explaining that. But all of us come from this, this pair, this couple. And we believe that they did, in fact, violate this one commandment. And then they lost these gifts. And that sin is automatically transmitted to the birth of every one of the children of the descendants of those two people, that, that couple. So you're born with original sin as a result of Adam and Eve. And that needs to be removed. And it can be by baptism. Now, later, we're going to get into all the animal sacrifices, and later, we're going to get into all the, the things that, that the Jews were doing, and then Christ came to change all that. But no animal sacrifice could ever um, give uh, a, a sufficient justification or payment for the, the sin of Adam and Eve. And the, the consequence of their sin, after they had failed um, to obey and hid themselves and made clothing one of my professors talked about, they made clothing out of fig leaves. If you've ever seen a fig leaf, it would be the most uncomfortable. First of all, it's small, but they had big fig leaves. They're the most uncomfortable feeling uh, uh, leaves you can have. I cannot imagine wrapping fig leaves around my waist and being comfortable. So anyway, th they started making clothes. Then God gives them clothes from animals, which is interesting. And then they're cast out of the garden. Now, one thing I wanted to share with you that very, very few people uh, that don't do Bible study realize is a statement in Genesis chapter three, right after Adam and Eve been cast out of the garden, where we get the beginning of what's called the good news, the evangelium, the great news that Christ comes to fulfill. Here we get the proto evangelium, the first good news in Genesis chapter three, verse 15. And this is where God is speaking to Adam and Eve after he's cast them out. And he said, I, meaning God, will put enmity between you and the woman. No, he's talking right here. He's talking to the devil. I'm sorry. He's talking to um, the devil, who is the serpent. He said, I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, Eve, and between your seed, meaning your children, devil, 
and her seed, meaning the descendants of Eve. And he said, he, meaning the descendant of Eve, shall bruise your head, which means the descendant of Eve shall be able to stomp on the head of the serpent. And you shall only be able to bruise his heel. This is the promise of Jesus Christ. The seed of Eve through Mary will be the one that defeats the devil once and for all and fulfills Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's an amazing phenomenon in the Bible. Someday, this offspring, who we know as Jesus, through the new Eve, which we know as the Blessed Mother Mary, will defeat the devil. And he does so by dying on the cross and being the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. So that's just an interesting thing. All right, here's the picture of the apple. That's why it's there. I tried to find another decent picture, but they were cast out of the garden. And once they got cast out of the garden, I hate to say this in a pun, but all hell broke loose. Uh, in addition to original sin, we now have personal sin. The first sin that really occurred after they, they went out was fratricide. Cain and Abel, Cain kills Abel. I mean, Abel kills Cain. No, I'm sorry, Cain kills Abel, uh, his brother. And then everything got so bad that in a very short number of centuries, there was so much violence and so much killing and so much lawlessness and so much hatefulness in the world that God decided to destroy the world and start all over. And he sent the flood and destroyed everything except for Noah, his family, Noah, his wife, sons and their wives, and two of all the animals Two or three of two of the all the animals except the, the, <coughs> the clean animals, there was more. But anyway, just a few of all the animals. And then the world was covered with water, and everything on the entire earth was destroyed. And then it starts all over. You have a new creation with Noah and so on. What followed the casting out of the garden was personal sin. And the church has defined basically three kinds of sin. One is original, which we talked about, that we're born with. We have no control over whatsoever, but we need to eliminate. And then there's two kinds of personal sin. Venial sin are small sins. Mortal sin, mortal, as you would assume, it means deadly. And mortal sin is what kills the soul. Now, a good analogy of that is the things that do happen in marriage. If anyone thinks that you get married and live happily ever after, you're either delusional or you've watched too many Hollywood movies, especially the old ones. Two people cannot live in harmony forever. It's just, it's just we're just too dynamic. We're too independent. We're too human. And so there's going to be times in a marriage that you have disagreements or arguments or, for lack of a better term, fights. You're going to fight with each other. And as long as those are easily reconcilable, usually about something inconsequential, uh, usually because one of you is tired or angry or whatever, um, that has caused a friction in your marriage. It's caused disharmony. It's caused you to be irritated with each other. But it's not ended the marriage. It has not resulted in divorce. It has not resulted in separation and ending the marriage and going your own way. It's venial, it's small. You say, I'm sorry. I learned years ago that there's a better way to do it. And that's, I, uh, please forgive me. <coughs> please forgive me for what I've done is a better way than saying I'm sorry because sometimes the response, particularly when the person you're saying I'm sorry to is upset with you, the response is yes, you are. And that doesn't make you feel very good. So please forgive me. And normally the forgiveness is fairly soon, it's completely accepted, and there's harmony. I always like to tell the class that what Beverly left, what Beverly did, she didn't have to do, we didn't have that many problems. We have never, never had that many problems, and they've always been reasonably small. But she would come to me when she was upset with me, and she'd bring my dinner, and she would she would walk up to the table with a plate and and not not very high above it, she'd just drop it. She just drop the plate and walk away, not say a word. Well, you know how much I love to talk. 
You can imagine. She's not going to talk to me. She's going to drop my food and walk away. I knew I was in trouble. So it didn't take me very long to say, please forgive me. And then we made up and everything was fine. Now that's a venial sin. And we do that all the time. We do that to God all the time. We do something that disappoints him. We do something to our brothers or sisters. We do something to our family. We do something to our neighbors. We don't do something we should do. We don't act the way we should act. We act stupid. We act selfishly. We act out of, out of some ridiculous reason. But we don't sever our relationship with God. Uh, an analogy of God's love is that it's, that it's like, it's like um, the rays of the sun. When the sun comes up, the rays come down and, and, and cover the earth. But every once in a while, there's a cloud and it's going to rain. And the cloud separates the rays of the sun. And we can't see it at all. We get no rays. All we have is cloud between us and the sun. Something has completely blocked the sun. So God's love is coming down to us. When we commit a mortal sin, we have completely severed our relationship with God. And there is a barrier between us and him so that his love cannot reach us. We are outside of his love. We are outside of the ability to love him and him love us. And that's called a mortal sin. And that's deadly, because if you die in the state of mortal sin, there's no way to, re, to, to say, I'm sorry. But if you reconcile, and that's where the confession and all this will come in, if you confess your sins and reconcile them and get the blessings of Christ himself and confess them to Jesus himself, and he forgives you, then that, that cloud is removed and you can be back in the original relationship. Fortunately, in our wedding and our marriage, we've never gotten to such a terrible situation that we divorced. Our marriage is still intact. Yes, a lot of little venial sins, but never anything like that. Our relationship with God is the same way. We're going to have a lot of little times when we're out of sorts with God or he's out of sorts with us because of what we've done. But we can be forgiven very easily. But if we ever commit a mortal sin, then we have to do something serious about it because it's so serious. Now, we'll talk about that. The conditions of that and you'll have a better understanding of that in, in, in a moment but it requires confession to restore now contrition means being uh, saddened for your sin and seeking forgiveness and so there's two kinds of contrition imperfect which means i want to reconcile this because i'm afraid of dying and i don't want to go to hell you, you know you want to have fire insurance you don't want to you don't you, you don't want to end up in hell so i'm going to i'm going to go to confession because i don't want to burn in hell. That's imperfect, but it, it's fine. It does reconcile you. It does show you're sorry. Perfect contrition is, is genuine love for God. It reminds me of my relationship with my father. My father was always very proud of me. He made it very clear. He would introduce me and, and brag about me and tell things about me that made me feel very, very proud to be his son because I knew he was proud of me. I never wanted to do anything that if he saw it or heard about it, he would say, well, I'm not proud of you for that. I really, I'm really disappointed in you. So I would never want to do anything that would cause him to lose his pride for me. And that's sort of the way it is with perfect contrition. I want to stay in, in harmony with God out of love because I don't want him to be disappointed with me. So that's that idea. Now, actual sin is what we're talking about. Question is, can the soul die? No. So it's going to live forever. And if it dies in the state of mortal sin, as I said, you're cast away from God. You're, you're going to be in a place where you will not be in the presence of God. And the timelessness, instead of having that joy that I mentioned before, that mountaintop experience, you'd be deprived and fearful and in darkness, and, and it would never change. Now, th sin itself, the definition of sin, can be a thought. I can think a sin. I can think sinful thoughts. I can have a sinful desire. I can want something that belongs to someone else or that, 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 that is, is in, immoral. I can say something or I can do something or I can fail to do something that I know I should do. And, and any of these things would be something that was forbidden by the law of God something from the commandments, something from the moral teachings, something we know God has established to us through this process that we know disappoints him. It's anything contrary to the will of God. 
And as we said, there's three kinds, original, venial, and mortal. And original sin is inherited from Adam and Eve, and we're denied from the beatific vision. That's why we want to have baptized, the children, babies baptized as early as possible. We don't know exactly what happens if a child dies who is innocent, but still has death with original sin on his soul. Jesus said, the only way to eternity, eternal life is through me. So if he hasn't been baptized, then it's possible. But we leave it to God's mercy, and God is very merciful. So we're not condemning any child to, to hell. We don't believe that. We don't know exactly how, but we, we believe that God is very merciful. But um, we do know when you're old enough to make a decision, which we say is the age of reason, about the second grade, seven years old, then you can commit sin yourself. A serious, for a mortal sin to be, to be mortal, First of all, the sin must be serious matter. And that differs from person to person. Serious matters to the Pope is a lot different than serious matter to me because he has a lot more theology and spiritual understanding and depth of, of faith and so on. So it relates to each of us. Also, it, it, so it can't be a simple thing. It's gotta be serious in nature. Some things that could be serious for me may not be serious for you. So it's, it's individual. Second, hey, you have to know what you're doing is wrong. So Bob. I know it's serious. I know God doesn't want me to do it. I know it's wrong. And I choose to do it anyway. Those three conditions have to exist for a sin to reach the level of mortal. So if I get mad or if, if I tell a lie, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to tell this person something that they ask me and I don't want to tell them the truth. So I, I tell a lie. Bob. Right? That's not mm -hmm. a mortal sin. That's a venial but yes, go ahead. I'm going to. Uh, this is Anthony. I was going to ask a question. Sure. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Um, with that being the age of seven and understanding, you said the difference between the different different understandings. Wouldn't ignorance be bliss in that situation? Like saying one sure. sin is not equal to, is not equal to someone else's sin like absolutely that was something i was trying to say i guess i didn't exactly get it across that way sure. um, when i had asked my question this is kiera by the way yes, it kind of yes. goes back to the original sin and not eating from the tree of knowledge right. and good and evil because you know a sin can is only i mean i know it kind of you know you're like okay well is this is sin is that a sin but a sin only goes as far as your knowledge. Exactly. You, yeah. you, you have to know it's wrong. Yes. Like, and that's, it's, like, it, yeah. and it's, a, it's an act of the will. And, and yeah. when we, there's a very, very important question because most people in a class that are adult that are going to go to first confession because they've been baptized are going to think this is going to be the most difficult thing. Father, you got to, you got to arrange for eight hours a day for two weeks. Cause I'm, you know, I'm, 30 years old, and I've done a lot of things, and I know this is going to take forever, and, and that's not it at all. You, you're not responsible for sins that you didn't know were wrong, and, and ignorance is bliss, except, and that's why taking a course like this is dangerous. I laugh about this. The more I study, the more I learn, the more I know I'm responsible for stuff that I didn't know was wrong before, but it's beautiful because you don't want to create things that are wrong. You want to know what God wants you to do. You want to do it because he wants you to do it. So it's beautiful. But in reality, that is true. A, a, a child in, in one family could do an act that would be considered a mortal sin. And a child in another family where that act is common and routine and everybody accepts it doesn't even commit a sin in their mind. And therefore, they can't be held accountable for it. Does that make but sense? I it, think it's, it sort of does, but it kind of it almost sounds like the more you dive into it, the more broken and incorrect we are as humans. No, no, because you're you're it's after you know that it's sinful and then you do it that, that you get into trouble. So if, if you grew up in, a, in an environment, let's just say you grew up in a family of thieves. And that's what they did. And they were all thieves. That's, that was what they did. And they did it and they justified it and everything else. And, and, and so you were, you were shoplifting. Uh, and the, the, the object is not to get caught. Well, once you come into the church and you realize that that was clearly wrong, you're taking goods and services from people that, that they belong to and it's wrong. Then if you shoplift, 
you're committing a, one, a, a sin, a sinful act, and it could be all the way up to a mortal sin. But before that, if you didn't know any better, you, you, you can't be, except for, now I, I got to clarify this one thing. There's a thing called natural law. And natural law is, means that by nature, we know certain things are right and wrong. All of us have a conscience. So I can't, you can't excuse everything. Um, and for instance, you could, everyone knows intrinsically that, that killing someone uh, unjustly, not in war or police, killing someone is just morally reprehensible. We know that. People in tribes in, in, in remote areas know murder is wrong. So there are certain things we know is wrong. Basically, stealing is a bad example because intrinsically you know it's wrong. But all these little nuances that you learn, and you learn them because you want to learn them, and you learn them because you want to love God, and you want to please God, and you want, just like your parents, you may do something as a child that is very innocent, and then when your, pop, your parents tell you, gee, I don't want you to do that anymore, it's wrong, then you don't want to do it anymore because you don't want to disappoint your parents. It's that kind of thing. But we'll get a lot more into this as we go through uh, and look in more detail at the theology here. But these are excellent questions. And, and I, I do want you to ask them. And again, um, the, the, this is the last thing that, that I need to, that need to cover is that mortal sins can be uh, forgiven by Christ in the sacrament of confession. And he gave that power to the apostles who gave it to their successors which include the bishops and the priests. And that's what we'll talk about in great deal of how we go and have those removed. Venial sins can be forgiven at mass. You can, God will forgive your venial sins just by asking, it's very simple. Um, but the interesting thing also that theology has taught us is that you can be, have your sins forgiven. So in other words, I can come out of confession, walk into the parking lot, get run over and not go directly to heaven. Why? Because there is a consequence for sin. Sin produces an action, and an action produces a consequence. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later. But the idea is that if, if I come to your house, let's say, let's say Anthony, I'm, I'm angry with you. So I, I drive over my car, I find out where you live. I get a brick. I walk up to your, your living room window, and I throw the brick through the window. Now, that's my action. Then I have remorse, and I feel really bad. And I actually come up to you and ring the doorbell and you come to the door and you're a very loving person. And I say, I'm really sorry about throwing the brick through the window. And you said, I forgive you. The window's still broken. The brick's still there. Something has to be offset to pay the price of the consequence. And that's called temporal punishment. And we'll talk about that more and more and more. There's ways that we can offset. But you don't automatically have everything taken care of just by going to confession, because there are consequences to our action. This is what the theology teaches. So um, the root of sin, the number one root of sin is pride. Temptation to disregard God. I want to be like God. You don't need to feel guilty for, for temptation because sometimes uh, because of the sin, uh, it, it may be an interior act. But we cannot turn a bad deed into good act. In the end cannot justify the means. And again, our culpability, as I mentioned, other than uh, uh, natural law, is based on the will. And then for an act to be morally good, the object of the action has to be good, the intention has to be good, and the circumstances have to be good. So again, you can't just say, well, I, this, this will be a good end. I'll do this bad thing to get a good end. I'll rob this bank to pay for money for my child's college. No, no. For the moral act to be good, it has to be, the object has to be good, the intention and the circumstance. And lastly, these are the seven deadly sins. And we'll, I'll just end here because I don't want to keep you over. Um, but these are the seven deadly sins and you, we'll talk about them again. But pride is the number one sin. Covetousness is to desire someone else's good, to desire a lot of material goods. Lust is a, a sin against chastity, to, to sexually desire someone. Anger is an emotional state when you, when you desire revenge. Gluttony can be food and drink, and it, it can even be work. You can, you can over consume all, all kinds of things. 
Envy is a sadness that you don't have something somebody else had. And sloth is to be lazy. And that can cross all kinds of things as well. So again, this is where we are. We're looking at God the Father, and we see that he created us in his image and likeness. He created everything visible and invisible. He created everything in heaven and earth. And I'd be happy, happy to stay and answer any question, go further, or I can delay it till next week, and we can pick up next week and begin to talk about it if you'd like to talk about it some more. But I'd like to stop here and remind you, we'll look at the beginning of the second one um, next next week, the second person, the Trinity. Okay, sort of got behind, but I got carried away with my Bible stuff. Anybody have any questions? Those are great, great questions. I really liked all of them and I, I hope uh, they were useful. Anybody else have any questions now at this point? Yeah, I, I had another question. I just good, wanted to let, give people a chance to leave if they wanted to leave before I asked. But if you ask a question, you ask the question everybody else wants to ask, so they should stay and hear it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, it was just was interesting to me because I'm sure that you've heard this before, but it sounded like uh, I was raised in the Catholic faith for a really long time, and I grew up with the entire mindset saying, if you go to confession or if you you know you talk to God and you ask for forgiveness he forgives you the and done. Right. So this is almost like the first time in all my teaching or my learning and everything. And there was a large gap about a decade or so. Mm -hmm. um, about temporal punishment? Yeah, that there, yeah. that there would be more. And it, it's always been a question that I thought like, oh, can Hitler just right before he shot himself be like, oh, I'm, I feel sorry. Well, he could if 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 Hitler just before he shot himself confessed to a priest and really meant it, he could be his sins could be forgiven, but the consequences of his sin would would still have to be paid for. And that's sort of when we, and the the way this all makes sense is when we get to it, and, I, and there's just not enough time to really give it the, the depth that it needs. But the idea of no. purgatory: when we die, you can go to one of three places. If you die in the perfect state of grace with all your sins forgiven, venial and, and, and moral, and your temporal punishment satisfied, then you can go directly to heaven. And there's a way to accomplish that. Most of us will die with maybe some unconfessed venial sins or and or some temporal punishment not completely satisfied. That is then taken care of if you will, in a place called um, purgatory. Purgatory is a place of cleansing. And this is all based on the theology that nothing imperfect can be in the presence of God. If I'm dying with, with, if you will, dark spots on my soul as an image, unconfessed venial sins, or I haven't satisfied the requirements for paying the debt for my broken windows, then I can make that occur, that cleansing, that removal of those spots in purgatory. And purgatory is not a pleasant place. It's not hell. It's not complete absence, but it is a place of purging, a purgation. And we spend, and again, time is not part of it because we don't understand after lifetime, but it's a, it's a process but once you die in the state of grace and get to purgatory, you are guaranteed by Christ to get to heaven. So that's the object. Get to the way station. Get to the, the outer room. Get to purgatory. Don't die in mortal sin. The only way you can go directly to hell is to die in mortal sin. If you don't die in mortal sin, then you're promised purgatory to be cleansed so that you'll be pure enough to be in the presence of the beatific vision. You don't want to carry a bunch of impurities in the presence of God. It would, it would probably destroy your soul, I don't know. But that's the teaching, that's the theology. So that's why we know that purgatory is a good place, but it's a painful place and you want to avoid it. And you can avoid it by, the, by using the sacraments, which we will talk about, but you want to avoid at all cost dying in a state of mortal sin. Does that make sense? Uh, it, it does. Quick follow-up question, though. 
Um, is this the same idea of purgatory that, like, in the 1800s, they sold passes for, or not? Yeah, no, that, yeah, that, that's a complete misunderstanding. That was called an indulgence. We'll talk about that. The indulgence is something that's been in the church forever. The indulgence is something that was beautiful, and it still is beautiful, and it's still available, and we'll talk about it. But an indulgence was being sold during the time St. Peter's was being built by some well-meaning bishops who were trying to raise money. And that was a terrible act, and it was totally invalid. And the church never taught that. It was something that a few individuals did, and it caused a lot of problem. And Luther was absolutely correct in condemning it, and the Council of Trent condemned it outright. So the selling of an indulgence was totally, totally wrong. But the indulgence is a means of avoiding a purgatory. And it's a beautiful thing. And we'll talk about that when we get further along. Okay? Hail Mary. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Anything else? You Hail sure? Mary. Okay, we'll do the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this is great. I'm glad you guys are asking questions. That means you're reading, and that means you're curious. Uh, please send me, you know, call me on the phone if you want to talk about something. Send me an email, but I'd rather talk than send an email. But whatever, uh, I'm here for each one of you as we go through this process, okay? All right, well, God bless. See you next Monday night.